Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for coming. Hello, hello. Getting a lot of people. This is awesome. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. It's so great to see you all. Hi, thank you so much for being here. It's actually not totally dark out yet, so it doesn't feel that late. It's the first first month of the year. It's great. It's awesome. Thank you all for being here. We are going to get started. Um, so if you are just popping in, no worries. Uh, I am going to quickly announce that we're having just a tiny bit of technical difficulty, but it's no big deal. Um, we are going to figure it all out. Um, but unfortunately, we won't be able to see Dr. Spellman, but you will be able to, to hear her. Um, so let me get started. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Bipolar 101, Recognizing, Managing, and Improving Lives, brought to you by NAMI Cook County North Suburban, Dr. Juliet Spellman, a psychiatrist at Northwestern Primary Care at the Lake Forest Hospital and the Glenview Public Library. I would like to take a second to thank the Glenview Public Library for sponsoring this event. The Glenview Public Library offers a variety of programs, collections, and online resources for all ages and interests. It's located at 1930 Glenview Road for those interested in stopping by. Thank you so much for your support uh, for making this night happen. We really appreciate you. And my name is Brie Hookstra. I am the program director at NAMI Cook County North Suburban. NAMI, or the National Alliance on Mental Illness, is the nation's largest grassroots mental health organization, providing public awareness, no-cost support, and education programs online and in person so that people and families affected by mental health conditions can build better lives. We are a lifeline to individuals and families who do not know what to expect in their difficult life journey. We offer classes and support groups and do a lot of local advocacy for mental health. Our programs are totally free of charge and open to those in our community service areas, but we do not turn anyone away who is in need. We are so pleased to have you all here tonight at our third webinar in our Mental Health Conditions, What You Need to Know series. This year, each month, mental health professionals will dig deep into a variety of mental health conditions to provide further education, to raise awareness, and to fight the end of the stigma surrounding mental health. For our topic tonight, Dr. Juliet Spellman will further educate us on bipolar disorder, specifically related to recognizing the presenting symptoms of bipolar syndromes, understanding the course of the illness, becoming familiar with some treatments and appreciating one's role in positive outcomes. NAMI National states that bipolar disorder is a mental illness that causes dramatic shifts in a, in a person's mood, energy, and ability to think clearly. NAMI National also states that the condition affects men and women equally with about 2.8% of the US population diagnosed with bipolar disorder and nearly 83% of cases classified as severe. This webinar will help anyone who is interested to know what bipolar disorder is and to start recognizing the symptoms in themselves or somebody else. Dr. Spellman states recognizing symptoms is the key to intervening in a positive way for better long-term outcome. We will leave plenty of time for Q&A at the end if you would like to type your questions in the chat box during our conversation, please. <laughs> Tonight's guest speaker, Dr. Juliet Spellman, is a licensed psychiatrist at Northwestern Primary Care at the Lake Forest Hospital. Dr. Spellman obtained licenses including Illinois Physician and Surgeon, Illinois Controlled Substance, DEA, and MPI. She holds two certifications, including American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology and Addiction Psychiatry. Dr. Spellman attended the University of Illinois Ur Urbana, where she obtained her bachelor's degree in honors biology, graduating magnum cum laude with distinction. She later obtained her master's degree at the University of Chicago. Post her graduation program, she remained at the University of Chicago 
to complete an internship in internal medicine, as well as her residency program in psychiatry and the chief residency program in psychiatry. She ended her educational career at the Institute for Psychoanalysis, where she took a three-year supervised course in advanced psychoanalysis psychotherapy. Her career history is substantial, where Dr. Spellman has obtained experience in the field for over 20 years in a variety of different settings. Now, Dr. Spellman works as a psychiatrist at Northwestern, working with adults in an outpatient psychiatry practice where she provides consultation to the inpatient medical services and teaches family practice residents. We are so thrilled to have her here tonight to further educate us on this ever important topic. I am honored to welcome our guest speaker tonight, Dr. Juliet Spellman. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. I'm sorry you can't see me, um, computer issues. So uh, there will be plenty of time for questions at the end. Uh, so write them down. Uh, I, I'll, I do want a little bit of a disclaimer though, as um, this is not to be construed as medical advice and I can't give personal, personal advice to anybody about your own situation or a family situation. So this is general information to help people uh, as I stated in my title slide, recognize, manage, and improve lives by having this information. It's really important to know what this is and what to look for. So next slide. So the objectives today are to recognize the symptoms of bipolar syndromes, of which there are several, I'll go through that, understand the course of the illness, become familiar with some of the treatments. We're not going to go too get too clinical on it, but just to familiarize yourself with some of the, the common treatments. And then to appreciate one's role in a positive outcome, whether you be a patient, a family member, a, a boss, a therapist, a teacher, anybody in the patient's uh, life, person who's dealing with this illness. Next slide. So a little bit about bipolar disorder, formerly called manic depression, but they moved away from that title of the diagnosis a few years ago is it seemed to have too much stigma associated with it. So there's the bipolar spectrum of illnesses. Um, and the one that was manic depression is bipolar one. Um, and the condition causes extreme mood swings that include emotional highs, mania or hypomania, and lows, depression. Mania is an abnormally elevated mood, while depression is an abnormally low mood, thus bipolar, two poles, up and down. These mood swings occur spontaneously. And let me clarify that a little bit. By spontaneously, they can be triggered by things that go on in your, your life, but they, they aren't just reactions to things in your life. These, these are mood swings that can occur just because you don't have a stable mood. Your brain can't keep your mood stable. So uh, they occur outside of life, although life can influence you having a mood episode. Medications are essential to the management of these episodes and symptoms. So they're not the only thing, but they're really important in getting people balanced and stable. So some basic facts and statistics, which Brianna talked a few, a little, a few of them about. They can present at any age, but often starts in the mid twenties, but really it can present from childhood all the way up to elderly years. Uh, often the first presentation is depression, uh, which is why it's missed. We'll get to that. Affects males and females equally. Children can present with it. Uh, they can have mood swings, but often irritability rather than depression. And children don't say, hey, mom, dad, I'm depressed. They'll have a behavior change or have a lot of difficulties expressing themselves and be rather irritable. The cause is not fully known, but genetic influence explains 60 to 85% of your risk of getting it. And if you have a first degree relative, like a parent with bipolar, you have a 10% likelihood of having the illness. 
why isn't that higher? Well, you have other, you get genes from two parents. It's not a hundred percent that you're going to get it. Um, but if you do have the genes, you're very likely to express them. Other risk factors are childhood trauma. Um, there's a lot of research now on what are called ACE, um, adverse childhood experiences. And they can be a lot of things that aren't necessarily considered trauma, but maybe a bad parental divorce or a very ill parent or an illness in yourself as a child, like a serious illness. Um, so a lot of things can affect uh, a person's childhood experiences and leave them with some difficulties later in life. Um, also just life stress and substance abuse uh, can cause uh, the onset of these mood episodes. Um, lifetime prevalence. Now this is different from what Brianna said. The, the percent of the population having bipolar right now is, I think you said 2.8%, but ever having have it in your lifetime is 4.4%. So uh, out of 100 people, four to five people are gonna have bipolar disorder or have had symptoms. So it's also, next slide, really important that the diagnosis of bipolar disorder is often missed, even by psychiatrists, often eight to 10 years delayed to the appropriate diagnosis for a couple reasons. One is um, patients don't go to the doctor and say, well, I was really felt good and I was really productive and get all this stuff done because it feels good. So they don't go and report those mood swings, but they'll go to the doctor and say, oh, I can't get out of bed. I can't get to work. I, I don't know what's wrong with me. I don't feel like living anymore. Help me doctor, fix me. Um, so unless a physician asks about mood swings, have you ever had an up mood? They're probably not gonna hear about them. And so it's my policy and I teach the residents when someone comes in and says they're depressed and you do your checklist and sure enough, they have all the symptoms, ask them if they've ever had an up mood. I have a chart later in the lecture that'll show you some of the, the, I give them to my patients and I'll ask them if they've had any of these definitions of up moods. It's amazing how many people I catch. So who haven't presented those symptoms on their own. So that's important to, um, to know and to look for. Bipolar often co-occurs with other mental health diagnoses. It's the rule rather than the exception. So having more than one thing is more common than not. Co-occurs with substance abuse, anxiety disorders, and ADHD um, in particular, but it can co-occur with any other uh, psychiatric illness. More than 50% of the illness time is spent in depression, no matter what kind of bipolar disorder you have you are spend this is well researched well documented more than 50 percent of your illness time is spent in the depression uh, it's an episodic illness and staying on medications is key to avoiding future episodes staying stable being more productive feeling better okay next slide so treatment and management are important because the costs of untreated bipolar disorder are immense. So there are personal costs, inability to work during an episode equals disability, loss of income. Um, it affects your relationships because you're not present, whether it's a partner, children, coworkers, friends, you just have a lot of uh, difficulties maintaining those relationships. And there is a loss of self-esteem and sense of control uh, that the illnesses are the illness or the symptoms are controlling your life. So it's important to, to manage the symptoms. Also, there's a societal cost. There's a lot of data on this. Uh, loss of work productivity, of course. Um, medical costs, disability, paying disability premiums. Um, uh, medical, you know, hospitalizations, medications. Ripple effects of an illness are far reaching because it doesn't just affect the patient, it affects the family or their friends or coworkers who have to double up and do extra work or, um, but let's assume you're a physician and have bipolar disorder, it affects your patients because you're not there to treat them. So it just has far reaching effects. So managing the illness is really important. Um, 
everybody feels, everybody in the patient's life feels the effects of the illness. Okay, so next slide. So we're gonna go a little bit into diagnosis and look at what the symptoms uh, of first mania and hypomania, then depression, and then we'll talk about how to apply this to life. So mania, literally mania, because hypomania is just a little bit different, is an elevated or grandiose mood or ir irritability, severe ir irritability, not just, hey, you're annoying me, get away, but you're just really irritable and increased activity or energy for at least a week. Now that week long requirement isn't required if somebody, their treatment is intervened and they're hospitalized and gotten on meds before the week. So if their mania is so bad, it's caught early, they can still be manic if they were psychotic or so, so symptomatic that they needed to be hospitalized. So it's grandiose mood or irritability, increased activity or energy for one week plus three of the following or four if only the mood is only irritable. So yes, inflated self-esteem, I'm, I'm the best you know, person on the earth, I can do all these things. Decreased need for sleep, I think that should be first because the sleep issue is pretty um, global. Most, most people have a decreased need for sleep when they're on the, in the mania. More talkative. Racing thoughts, that literally means that your thoughts are going faster in your head. You have a hard time keeping up with them. Distractibility, hard time keeping your focus on one thing. Increased in goal-directed goal activity, so you're doing more projects or things. Maybe you're not getting them done, but you're doing more things. Or psychomotor agitation, so you're just, your energy's unfocused and you just feel revved and pacing maybe. Um, involvement in risky activities without regard to the consequences. In fact, you don't think there are negative consequences. Spending sprees, increased sexual activity, risky investments. You lack the ability to see consequences, uh, negative consequences. You think everything's just fine. And this is, this is a manic episode. It also requires a marked impairment in functioning. So you can't um, be manic without an impairment in functioning, then you're hypomanic if, if it doesn't have a marked impairment in functioning. It can't be due to something else like a medical condition or substance abuse. Recently saw a patient who said, yeah, I've had these up moods. I've been a four or five before. And I said, well, tell me about that. And he said, well, it was when I was doing meth. Okay, that that's not mania. That was a substance induced um, elevated mood. And he'd never had it without doing a substance. So he's not bipolar. Um, um, and any psychotic symptoms, delusions, hallucinations, thinking you're the CEO of a company when you're not, something like that, you are manic. You can't be hypomanic and have psychotic symptoms be delusional. Now hypomania, hypo, why is it called hypomania? Hypo means below, so less than mania. So hypomania is less than mania. So it's similar but it only requires a four day duration and no marked impairment. So again, I'm gonna show you on a chart in a little bit what that looks like in a definition, a description, but it's some of these symptoms to a lesser degree, maybe one to two hours less sleep, um, energy, you're still able to work, but maybe you're annoying because you're talking all the time and you can't sit still, but you're, not, you're impaired from your normal self, but you're not markedly impaired. You don't usually need hospitalization when you're hypomanic. Take notes. If you have any questions, we'll have questions at the end. So next slide, talk about depression. So it's the other pole of bipolar disorder. Depression, and most people are familiar with depression, five or more of the following symptoms for a period of at least two weeks. That's what's called a major depression with at least one of the symptoms being depressed mood or lack of pleasure. So you have to have depressed mood or lack of pleasure or enjoyment to have a depression. Um, but with that, you can have markedly decreased interest in um, activities, increased or decreased sleep most days, significant change in appetite or weight. So you can gain weight, um, have an increased appetite, lose weight, not be interested in food a significant observable change in motor activity. So not an internal feeling, 
but people, if they looked at you, would see you fidgety and restless or really slowed down and having a hard time getting up off the couch and not moving as much as you normally do. Fatigue or loss of energy, very common in my depressed patients. Feelings of worthlessness or inappropriate or excessive guilt. These are cognitive symptoms. So it's negative thinking, I'm no good. Uh, why does anybody like me? Um, what, why am I here? Um, problems concentrating or making decisions. I've had people with depression think they're getting dementia because they can't remember things, but it's just really because their brain isn't working. Um, they can't make decisions. It just, everything feels overwhelming and they can't process the information they need to, to make a decision. And then of course, the, one of the more serious symptoms are recurrent thoughts of death or suicidal thoughts or behaviors that of course we get worried about and have to look at hospitalization um, sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes depending on the severity. If somebody has a plan or intent to act, then of course we hospitalize to keep them safe. Um, but just having a thought that what would it be like doesn't necessarily require hospitalization. So please be honest with your provider if you are feeling depressed and feeling that way because it's important to share that information and look at what you might need to do to keep yourself safe or improve your mood. All right, so oh, one more diagnosis slide and then I'm gonna tie it all together. So the next slide, types of bipolar disorder. So bipolar one, formerly known as manic depression is ever having had a manic episode, that's all you need for the diagnosis of bipolar one is ever having had a manic episode. You don't have to have any depressions, most people do, but you have to have had a manic episode, even one precipitated by antidepressants, you are diagnosed bipolar one. Bipolar two, kind of considered a lesser form, you've never had a manic episode. If you've ever had a manic episode, you're bipolar one. For bipolar two, you've ever had a major depressive episode with any hypomanic episodes, any lower, less than mania episodes, mood swings that meet the criteria for hypomania with having had a major depressive episode. Other bipolar disorders also known as bipolar not otherwise specified or atypical bipolar disorder are mood swings not meeting the criteria for classic bipolar one or bipolar two, but still swinging. So this is a category I use for people who kind of swing in and out of depression, never have had a hypomania or a mania, but they have an unstable mood from normal to depressed, normal to depressed, often not responsive or not fully responsive to antidepressants. And guess what they do better on? A mood stabilizer. So I then consider them somewhere in the bipolar spectrum. And if I look hard enough, I usually find some kind of relative who had bipolar disorder. So they got maybe a piece of a gene that, that made them more likely to have mood swings and less likely to respond to antidepressants. Cyclothymia um, is not talked about as much. Um, it's mood swings from hypomania to uh, depression, but depressions that don't meet criteria for major depression. And that might be because it, it only lasts a week at a time. You need that two week time frame to have a major depression. So cyclothymia um, has depressions. You have to have ups and downs for this, um, but not meeting criteria for major depression. So maybe not the full blown, not long enough, or maybe not enough symptoms. Um, and it's over the course of two years. So, a uh, number of mood episodes over the course of two years. And then some other diagnostic considerations are rapid cycling for more mood episodes in a year. I do even have patients who cycle within a week. So they are really ultra rapid cyclers. Um, mixed states uh, were a little bit harder to treat, but people who have manic and depressive symptoms at the same time, you're up and racy, but your mood is depressed and dysphoric. You don't feel good. You feel off and bad and a lot of the depressive symptoms, but you're not sleeping and, and energized and doing things at night, but not in a happy, good way. Mixed states, people in mixed states generally don't feel very good at all. And then with anxious distress, that can occur in any mood state. People are very anxious, restless, 
um, uncomfortable thoughts are generally very anxious. Um, and that can indicate some different treatments. All right, so let me um, tie this into my title, which is recognizing. Um, so we wanna recognize the illness and that's all well and good for a provider. Some of you um, might be uh, physicians, uh, medication prescriber, prescribers, nurse practitioners, um, physician's assistants. Uh, you might be a therapist, so you're versed in some of these symptoms and how to recognize them and how to ask, for the, ask about them. But what if you're a family member or a friend, uh, a boss, somebody who's not well-versed in in these, these criteria, how do you recognize? You're not gonna sit down with a checklist and say, okay, do you have this, this, this? What you're going to look for is a change in, in this person that you know. So somebody you live with, has their sleeping schedule changed, their sleeping habits, all of a sudden they're going to bed an hour or two later, they have a lot of energy at night. Um, they're more talkative. So it's a boss or somebody, a friend or somebody you work with these, gosh, you know, gosh, Joe, you're really talkative. You know, you're not used to them being that way um, or maybe more irritable than normal. So you're going to look for a change in behavior. Of course, this is a mood disorder. So you might look for a change in mood, but often that is not the first sign. That's not first, the first sign or symptom. Sleep changes are occur often very early. Um, and so noticing that for a patient too, if you're a patient, you want to recognize your own symptoms, your very early symptoms as early as possible. You can catch a mood disorder, work with your provider, get it treated so you don't even have an episode. You catch it before it even becomes something. And if you're smart, you'll listen to your family and friends too who are recognizing, hey, you seem a little off. So recognizing the early signs and symptoms is really, really important. Um, and you, I can't stress this one enough. I teach all my patients when they're diagnosed bipolar, this is something we go through in the early, early um, appointments. What are your early symptoms? What do we need to pay attention to? What do you need to pay attention to? What do you need to learn? The other thing that's important to learn are your triggers. Um, so what causes you not sleeping? Um, you know, is it stress at work? Is it, you know, changes in relationships? Is, are there anything, any triggers that, that cause you to have a symptom that will then kind of snowball into an episode? Once you learn those and can manage those, um, recognize them early and manage them, then you're going to be better off and you're going to avoid hospitalizations. You're going to avoid disability. You're going to avoid spending more time in your symptomatic states. Um, so let me go over the chart here that's up on the screen now. So on the next slide, so this is a chart I hand to patients and it's a chart, <laughs> I'm old, so I've been doing this 30 years. So this is a paper chart. There are apps that a lot of the younger generations will get on, eMoods is one of them, and you can track your mood um, in other ways. But in the office, I don't have my phone open. So I have, um, I hand people this chart and say, well, ignore the chart at the top and read the definitions on the bottom. And if you go to the next slide, they're printed out bigger. And um, so you, I say to them, okay, start at zero and read up for me and tell me if any of these pluses have ever described a mood state that you've been in. And people will either say, you know, no, or yeah, you know, I've definitely, and, and I'll also ask what's the highest one that's ever described, you know, that you've ever experienced. And then we'll just, I'll just have them describe it and see if it really meets that and make sure it wasn't substance induced because obviously that wouldn't count. Um, and then I'll have them do the same thing down. What's the, what's the lowest mood you've ever uh, gotten to? And then I'll ask, what's your current mood? By these definitions, what's your current mood? I like the scale plus five to, to minus five with zero being normal because people will try to use that scale of 10 to me. And I'm like, well, what is five normal? Like what, what's your scale? This way, zero is normal. You don't have a mood episode. You, you're normal even 
and then plus one plus two plus three plus four plus five minus one minus two minus three minus four minus five and the higher the number um the bigger the number the more symptomatic you are um so it's really helpful really helpful especially early in the illness early in my course of treating someone for someone to keep a mood chart and then we can see if medications are working are their mood swings getting less intense are they getting less frequent those are really the important things to monitor for women do you cycle does your cycle impair or affect your your mood at all uh your your hours of sleep i use those little boxes at the top sometimes i put the hours of sleep that somebody gets and we can track mood with sleep um so really, really important to um, get a diagnosis correctly and recognize your symptoms, um, help other people know what your symptoms are, recognize your triggers so you can avoid or manage your triggers and uh, share all that with your provider so that you can get appropriate treatment early on from the beginning and not wait eight to 10 years to get um, the appropriate diagnosis. So I know there are going to be questions, but moving on, um, if I were doing an in-person lecture, I would probably take a little bit of a break there and take questions for that section. So, um, but we'll go on to the, the treatment. So recognizing was the first part. Managing is the second part of my lecture. And that is looking at treatment and uh, taking care of yourself. So pharmacologic treatments, medication, obviously a mainstay for treating bipolar disorder. Talk therapies, we'll get into that. They're very important. And self-directed care, all, all three of these, equal importance. Medications, primary because you have to get on them, but then the other two uh, types of treatment are just as important. Next slide. So regarding medications, I've already said it. They're essential to the management of the episodes and the symptoms. Staying on medications is key to avoiding future episodes. If you don't stay on your meds, they can't work. And this is important because, as we said earlier, bipolar disorder is an episodic illness. You will have well periods. Well, I don't need meds. I feel good, right? Wrong. Because... You're bipolar. It's a chronic illness. You're going to have another mood episode. So going off your meds at any point. Um, I have a, a woman who's now in her 60s, but she or she's actually 70. And so I've treated her for many years. And she went off of her meds five times in her 50s, um, 40s to 50s. And um, Finally, after the fifth time, she goes, I think I need to stay on my medications. And I smiled. I said, yeah, I think that would be a good idea. But thankfully, she did listen to her family. And they were the ones who would say, you know what? You're, you're depressed again. You're not doing well. Um, in her later years, she didn't have any uproots. She just had the, the downswings. Um, but yeah, if she had stayed on her meds, she probably wouldn't have had so many depressions. The other issue, though, with meds is side effects. They, they aren't always friendly to our bodies and to our brains. So if, if, if a medication... ...to take them, right? So you have to work with your provider. Um, so how is this accomplished? You and your provider are a team. Please work with your provider. Please be honest with your provider. Tell them your symptoms. Tell them what you don't like about your meds. Don't just stop your meds. Please don't just stop your meds. Tell your provider what you don't like. What's working? What's better? I always ask, well, what's better? Okay, so what's not better? Um, what do we need to look at? What do we need to change? Um, and when I started in psychiatry, um, there was a handful of medications. We had so few things. And now we have a basket full of medications. So there are a lot of options, a lot of options. So if you don't like one thing, tell your provider why. And those, those comments help us gear your treatment to something that will work for you. Um, we can only make informed decisions in your care about what to do next if you tell us what's going on, if you share with us. 
advocate for yourself, but listen to your provider. Hopefully your team and they work well together, but there are, there are, um, and if you don't feel like your provider is listening, maybe, maybe you need to get somebody you can work with better. Um, I know that's hard these days. There were shortage of psych providers, but I know there's long waiting lists. I'm currently not taking new patients because I'm booked out for a year. So it's uh, for new patients. So it's a crazy time. Um, lots of people seeking, seeking good care. So be patient, um, but work together with your, with your provider. Um, okay, so treatment, next slide. Mood stabilization is the primary goal, not just treating depressions, not just treating manias, but stabilizing the mood. That means fewer episodes, less intense up and downs. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the medications used to stabilize the mood. So these are mood stabilizers that I'm going to talk about. I don't want to get too clinical. Um, this isn't a clinical talk. This is a more a let's get familiar with some of the meds talk. So I don't want to get too, too detailed about it, but I just want to help people become familiar with some of the common names. Lithium. No other med like it. It's a salt. It's been around for a long time, since the 1950s. Excellent for mania. Um, main side effects of thirst, tremor, stomach upset, tiredness. You need to monitor, uh, your, your provider needs to monitor your kidney function and thyroid over time. Um, and it's important to maintain consistent salt and water intake. Why? Lithium's a salt. What happens if you, oh, you know what? I heard on, uh, I read on the internet, you know, Dr. Google, that a low salt diet's really good for me and you're on lithium. What happens if you drastically decrease your salt intake? What does your body start conserving, holding on to because you've stopped taking in table salt? Lithium, guess what? You get toxic. So it's just important to maintain a consistent salt and water intake and run by your provider any changes that might happen. Um, so, oh, I heard that drinking, you, you normally say drink four or five glasses of water a day. Oh, I should be drinking eight. And you start drinking eight um, and you dilute your lithium and you start peeing it out. So your level, all of a sudden your provider's like, why is your level 0.4, you know, where it was 0.8 before. So it's really important that you don't make any major changes to your diet without talking to your provider. Um, and that really only pertains to lithium. There's the anticonvulsant family of medications, namely Depakote. Most people call it Depakote and not valproic acid. Carbamazepine or Tegretol and Lamotrigine or Lamictal. Um, these um, all very good. Um, Depakote and Tegretol treat mania. Lamotrigine does not. It prevents mania, but it will not treat a manic episode. They all have their pluses and minuses. Depakote's good for rapid cycling. Common side effects are tremor, hair loss, weight gain, and sedation. Tegretol, sedation, dizziness, GI upset, some unsteadiness sometimes. Lamotrigine, skin issues. Your, doc, your provider should absolutely tell you about this. It's rare, but it can be serious, and you have to go off of it if, if you notice anything skin, but um, it's rarely an issue, like 0.08%, not, not common. So it's not a reason to not take it. Um, mild forgetfulness, blurred vision. Um, generally very well tolerated though, Lamotrigine, because it doesn't, usually doesn't cause weight gain, which people like. Um, very good for that. Oh, I didn't put it on the slide. Very good for depression, the depression side of things, the Lamotrigine in particular. It's the, the one that has the most benefit on the depression side of things. Um, and then there are the atypicals, so things like, I'll say also the brand name, so aripiprazole, which is Abilify, quetiapine, which people hate because it's Seroquel, it causes weight gain, it makes people really tired. It works for mania, but yeah, it's got some side effects that make it hard to um, tolerate, um, but it is it can get people to sleep. Olanzapine, which is known as Cyprexa, Cariprazine, which is Raylar, you see it on the TV commercials. There's There are other ones, Lorazidone, which is... Um, lorazidone, which is Latuda, which is for bipolar depression. There's a new one called Capilita. I think that's also might be on TV for also for depression, but not 
those last two aren't for mania. So anyway, these are things that your, your provider will hopefully know about and can choose one of these if uh, they, it seems to be indicated. Um, some treat all phases, some treat just depression, as I mentioned a, com a couple, and some treat just mania. So that's up for your, to your provider to know those indications and what works for what. Um, it's your job to say if whatever you got prescribed helped you feel better or if there are any side effects. Um, common side effects of this atypicals are unfortunately weight gain. Um, it can make you hungrier, but it can also mess with your feeling full. So often people keep eating because they don't feel full. So I always tell my patients, eat with your eyes, don't eat with your stomach. So if you normally eat a bowl of cereal and a glass of orange juice for breakfast, and all of a sudden you're eating two bowls of cereal, a glass of orange juice, toast, and then later a banana, all those are extra calories are just going to go on as weight. So you try to keep your diet pretty consistent. Sedation, glucose, and lipid issues. These all can affect your, your sugar and cholesterol levels. So over time, we have to monitor those. Um, uh, bipolar disorder has an increased risk independent of medications of diabetes. There's an increased just likelihood of having diabetes because you have bipolar disorder. So that we think there's some genetic link. Um, so weight gain isn't good for this whole population of uh, patients. Um, and the meds sometimes add to that. So we have to be careful about that. Um, so next slide, uh, just some additional considerations for treatment. It's really important to stabilize the mood before adding medication for any other disorder, anxiety disorders, ADHD, residual depression. If you try to treat somebody's depression with an antidepressant who really has bipolar disorder, what's gonna happen? they're not gonna get better and they might get worse. Or they might get better very temporarily, but then it quote, stops working. I've heard that so many times over the years. Well, the medication worked for a little bit and then it stopped working. Um, so that's often a clue to look for bipolar disorder. I've been on five meds and they work for a little bit, but then they stop working or they don't work at all and I got all the side effects. Um, so mood stabilizer, mood stabilizer, mood stabilizer, then you can look at treating someone's ADHD or social anxiety disorder um, or an ongoing depression. Treat substance use disorders early on. Untreated bipolar, you're more likely to abuse substances. Substance use disorders, more likely to pre uh, precipitate a uh, mood episode. They need to be co-treated. Obviously, when you're in an acute episode, you're not gonna be in a mental place where you can participate in treatment. But once out of that episode, uh, get into an IOP, get into a program, tell your provider about it, make sure that um, um, it's co-treated and attended to, because if it isn't, it's going to make your bipolar worse down the road, even on medications. ECT, shock treatments. Um, yes, we still use them much better than even when I was trained uh, more, more simpler, safer, um, very effective treatment for severe mania or depression. Uh, main concern is loss of memory, but it usually resolves. People read about it and get, uh, get afraid for it. But you have to realize that on the internet, you hear about the worst, you know, who's, who's on talking about their problems with a medication or a treatment or something. It's the, the, the worst one to 5% of patients. So that often scares people like, well, I read on the internet, I'm like, well, okay, let's really talk about what that means and what percent of people are struggling with that. Um, then some people hear about TMS and ask me about it, transcranial magnetic stimulation. It's not really indicated for bipolar patients because it can precipitate mania. I've seen it a couple of times, or at least hypomania, we caught it. So I'm, I'm don't, refer my bipolar patients for it just because I've already had a couple of issues with it. So like I said, it's challenging. So I'm not going to say it's never used, but um, I have another patient that's before he came to see me, he, he, it did precipitate a manic episode uh, when another provider, he has pretty severe depression. So I understand why this provider sent him for it, but it did precipitate a mania. So we do have to be careful using TMS and bipolar and it's generally not 
it can be problematic, generally not recommended. Um, so that's medication. I know that's a lot of information and a little bit of uh, time, but just an overview. Next slide is talk therapies. So they're just fluff, right? Just if you need it, if, if you need somebody to talk to. And eh, wrong. Research shows that therapy is an essential part of treatment for bipolar disorder, not an extra. Um, there are a number of kinds. I just put a few here. Uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, known as CBT. It examines thoughts, cognitive, and behaviors to increase healthier thinking, recognize your negative thoughts, change those thoughts, and thus change, hopefully, your behaviors in response to those thoughts. It's very homework-based. It's, um, hang on. Sorry, um, very homework based. So there might be a workbook or sheets that you take home, homework assignments that you do that help you and your therapist look at, oh yeah, when I was doing this, I realized that my automatic thought is I'm no good. And what did that do? Well, I get depressed. Oh, well, what could you think when you're doing that? How do you change that tape that plays in your head, those automatic thoughts? And you work on recognizing those thoughts and changing them so that they don't bring you down into an episode. And then your behaviors become more positive and more um, healthy. So uh, there's another type of therapy called interpersonal and social rhythm theory, therapy. Uh, it promotes an active participation in tracking your mood and your sleep, your diet, your medication to establish healthy routines. Uh, routines can feel boring and, and routine and humdrum, but they're really important in patients with bipolar disorder, especially your sleep routines. Um, but it, this really yeah. helps you get into a better uh, rhythm in your life, uh, thus social rhythm therapy. Um, but that also can address interpersonal problems in a patient's life to help their overall functioning improve in their relationships. Uh, a lot of people have heard of, about DBT, Dialectical Behavioral Therapy. It started it, out of um, a provider, a, a physician recognizing bipolar, uh, borderline personality disorder in herself, and she developed this type of uh, treatment. Uh, but now it's used widely for many types of problems. And it's a skills-based training to achieve mindfulness help people with distress tolerance. So when they're feeling uncomfortable, overwhelmed, to tolerate that feeling rather than acting out on it and having a negative response to it, regulate one's emotions uh, in a healthy way. Um, again, not, not act out on them or do things that aren't healthy and uh, improve interpersonal effectiveness. So relationships become healthier because you're uh, communicating better, you're advocating for yourself, um, you're not um, in a in negative spiral uh, and not, not in negative patterns. So DPT can be very, very helpful. There's a growing number of programs and individual therapists who offer DBT and are trained in DBT. So um, it can be a really, really helpful, um, a practical therapy. It's also something that uh, deals with the present. So you're not uncovering your childhood or you're not talking about your past. You're really staying in the present and managing your emotions, your behaviors, your reactions to things right in the present. Um, next slide on uh, more on talk therapies. Uh, group psychoeducation. Often this is done on inpatient units, but they do have some outpatient programs, particularly a uh, Partial hospital programs, what's called a PHP or an IOP, um, intensive outpatient programs where they do uh, group therapy where you talk about medications, learn about symptoms, the diagnosis, you share with others, you get support. Uh, you can learn that other people, wow, I'm not alone. Other people have this. I, I didn't know. I felt often people can feel isolated and alone when they have um, a mental illness and talking about it and seeing that other people have similar symptoms similar side effects, it can make you feel validated and, and not so um, odd or out there or crazy. I've heard all those words in my, in my office. So um, group psychoeducation can be really helpful. 
um, family therapy, improve family communication, promote positive family participation in the patient's care. Um, it can be important, especially when there's some dysfunction or some discomfort or some problems with family relationships. So um, uh, family therapy is often also uh, part of an IOP or a PHP program and certainly in inpatient programs too. Um, support network is not really a talk therapy, but it's a bridge between the talk therapies and self-care, which I'm gonna talk about next because it involves other people and it's creating a group of people you trust for support and honest feedback and that you listen to when they say you don't seem right. So you develop this support net network of people you can go to share with, listen to, and who will watch out for you. Um, that's really important. It could be your family, it could be friends, it could be an AA group if, if that's part of your treatment plan. It could be a boss, um, coworkers. If it's not crossing the line, you might be able, need to be a little bit careful there. But you know, if somebody notices at work that you're off, because that's where we spend a lot of your our time, it might be helpful if you are close to someone, uh, close enough to somebody to share, uh, you know, a little bit about like, hey, you know, if you notice me doing this, could you tell me? Because sometimes I don't notice that I'm doing it. Um, Again, you kind of have to be careful. It depends on your work environment and you don't want to cross any boundaries, but um, you do spend a lot of time in the work environment usually. So if you are working, so it's important to, to recognize some of the changes that might happen there. But the point is to create a support network. You don't do this alone. Next slide. All right, third part of management is taking care of yourself. Very, very important biggest part of taking care of yourself is taking your meds. So somebody can prescribe them, but you need to take them. Um, so self-directed care is a patient's active participation in their own care and is essential to their well-being. So you can't, you know, for you have pneumonia, you just take an antibiotic, it kills the bugs and you don't have to do very much except take the antibiotic. But bipolar disorder is so much more than that. Yes, you can take your meds, but there are so many other pieces to it, as we've just learned. So you need to become self-aware, know your symptoms and triggers, identify an episode early on, work with your provider. A regular sleep cycle is of prime importance. I don't I want to be able to stay up. Okay, you want to be able to stay up. There's a consequence to that if you constantly, you know, eh, I want to watch this movie you're you could be a little off the next day or in a couple days this regular sleep cycle is really important i can't even emphasize that enough um there are journals and mood apps as i said emoods is one of them it's probably the best known there are online sites that can help a patient keep track of their mood um you can do the old-fashioned way like with that mood chart um you can on the mood chart, keep track of your sleep cycle, the number of hours that you're getting. A lot of people wear those watches, which uh, some are better than others. Um, you can get a little too uh, dependent on those. I've read articles about that, research articles about that, um, but they can give you an indication if you're sleeping deeply or waking up a lot. Um, but you do wanna track your sleep cycle, keep track of your mood, keep track of stressful events, and uh, women probably keep track of your cycle also. Um, Healthy lifestyle. I mean, obviously this is important for every, anybody, just generally, but diet and exercise help with weight and brain health. Uh, one of the things research has shown over the last 10 years so strongly is that one of the best things we can do for our brain is exercise, be physically active. It doesn't have to be like I'm working out and lifting you know, weights and it's just physical activity. Take a walk after dinner. Um, you know, if you have stairs in your house, run up and down the stairs a few times just to get your heart rate going and get your oxygen pump into your brain. Any kind of physical activity has been shown to help brain health. Um, and of course, exercise keeps your weight in a better place too. Um, healthy lifestyle. We talked about sleep cycle needing to be maintained. A lot of data on meditation and mindfulness, lots and lots of data on how helpful these uh, two similar types of um, activities are. Um, 
And, and they've also been shown to help with weight loss too, because anything that decreases your cortisol, so anything that's relaxing is going to help your stress hormone decrease and cortisol makes us maintain, uh, retain weight, extra calories that we've eaten. So uh, mindfulness and meditation, really good for the brain. Mindfulness is learning to stay in the present and be uh, mindful, appreciative, gratitude, staying present, not worrying about the future past, um, being aware of where you are. Uh, meditation goes a little bit further and allows you to empty and clear your mind of all the clutter. And you can, it's very relaxing, you can slow your heart rate. Um, but it's also good for brain health and it's been shown to help manage, um, mood episodes and anxiety. Um, there are apps, tons of apps, Headspace, Insight Timer, Calm, um, I'm forgetting one. There's breathing apps called, uh, there's Breathe. So there's, a, there are a number of apps. There are often free versions. So you can try it before you, some of them, if you buy them, you get more you can get deeper and get more uh, services from the, the app. Um, there's readings, there's classes, there's uh, YouTube videos. You, there's a lot of places that you can learn how to be mindful and meditate. Um, oh, that's a mis misspelling. Mindfulness and meditation can be very helpful. Um, next slide. So let's talk. Um, well, let me, before I do the summary slide, let me talk a little bit about tying in my title, improving lives. So if you do these three steps and you take care of yourself and you learn about your meds and you work with your provider, your life is going to improve because you'll be more stable, but you improve other people's lives too, because your influence on them improves. You feel better. They feel better. Um, so it has a huge ripple effect. So we're improving a lot of lives by treating one person. So I'm gonna go over the summary and then we'll be open for questions. So it's a episodic chronic illness. It's episodic, but even in between episodes, you need to take your meds to hopefully prevent episodes but sometimes it just lengthens the time between them. Even if you take your meds, you might have an episode, but it might be less intense. And instead of in six months, it's two years down the road. So that's really important. Episodic chronic illness that is treatable, but not curable. Medications are essential to the management of the episodes and symptoms, but the other therapies are just as important. It's really important to look at all three medications, therapy and uh, self-care. Know your triggers, catch your symptoms early. I, again, cannot emphasize this enough to know yourself. Avoid full-blown episodes and hospitalizations and disability and, you know, illness time. You, you'll just know it because you'll feel better. Be a team with your provider. Communicate. Communicate honestly. Be honest about your symptoms. Uh, be honest about your side effects. Don't just stop your meds and then tell them three months later, like I just had a conversation with someone last week. I mean, I, I was nice about it, but I was like, well, why didn't you tell me about this? Well, I knew I was coming to see you. I mean, I would say in a few days or a week. Yeah. But, <laughs> uh, but even then I prefer to get a message and say, hey, I'm having really having a hard time with this. But three months, two months later, that's not I was coming to see you. So um Develop a support network of people you trust for support, and honest feedback. You listen to them, okay? Also, consider giving one or two people permission to speak with your provider, spouse, partner, parent, child, adult, child, close friend, somebody, because that, that ability to keep you safe and well can be really, really helpful. I will say that if someone calls me um, about a patient um, and I don't have permission to speak with them, I'm not allowed to even say that you're my patient, but I can say I can listen to you. I said, well, tell me what you have to say. And, um, and that's all I can say. So I, 
it's it's tough though if somebody says well you can't tell them i called i said well then i can't use this information how am i going to use it if i don't know it i'm not allowed to use it so that can be kind of tricky um just had this conversation with a, a patient's dad yesterday so um uh, yeah so i yeah thanks for the information but i can't use it if i can't tell the person where i got her if they know don't know the patient that they don't know i said i can fish around for these symptoms but if they don't tell me i can't there's only so much so he heard the uh reasonableness of that and said yeah you can you can tell them that i i talked to you so um it's really helpful though to have have some outside um input um and I understand privacy and you can talk with your provider about that um, and what, what to say or not say, but just in terms of good care and keeping yourself well, it can be really important. So a lot of information, um, time for questions. Um, and Brianna, how's this gonna work? Hi. Okay. Let's see. So we do have a bunch of questions in the chat box. I can read them for you if you'd like. Yeah, I can't. I don't know why I can't Perfect. see the chat box. So that would no be... worries. I got okay. you. All right. So uh, first question says CPTSD. Could that be confused or diagnosed when it is actually bipolar? Um, so for people who don't know, uh, that's complex post-traumatic stress disorder and, um, you get pretty much anything can be uh, confused with anything. It, it just takes a good diagnostician to ask about that. I, we certainly see a lot of people with trauma. I do in my office, uh, with a variety of diagnoses and bipolar is no different. But for bipolar, you have to have clear mood episodes. You don't need that for complex PTSD. You can have mood episodes, but they're in the context of trauma. So you're gonna get a trauma history from someone you're diagnosing with complex PTSD. Um, and, and they might have some mood episodes, but it it's just takes a good diagnostician to tease out, are there mood episodes meeting bipolar one or bipolar two? Um, because PTSD is going to be treated with, without bipolar is going to be treated probably with an SSRI um, or an SNRI, certain antidepressants, which uh, calm down the nervous system and really help uh, that anxiety because PTSD, there's a lot of anxiety with, with trauma and PTSD. Um, whereas you're not going to use that as the primary treatment in bipolar. So it just takes a good diagnostician to ask those questions and be patient. And you might misdiagnose at first and say, oops, you know, we, we, we didn't see this. Uh, that's happened to me where you think it's one thing. And over time, it's pretty clear that it's something else or both. Um, but when there's bipolar, got to treat that first, got to stabilize the mood. And then you add the meds for the other diagnoses. So it's always important if there is bipolar to, to treat that. So you don't make it worse with the other medications. Thank you so much, Dr. Spellman. Um, next question says, is it okay to ask a family member if they are bipolar? Um, sure, why not? I mean, uh, you might want to find, might want to try to find a, a nice way to, to ask that and say, hey, I've noticed that you seem to be up and down sometimes. Is there something going on? Um, hey, I've read a lot about bipolar and, um, or my friend has bipolar, I've seen this and, and you seem to have some of the same symptoms. Is that something you've considered? I think there are ways you could ask it that are like, hey, are you bipolar? <laughs> because sometimes it can seem pretty judgmental when people like, uh, and they use it, yes, I'm sorry, they do. People use this, you're so bipolar. It's a very kind of derogatory, um, you know, kind of funny. Oh, it's meant to be funny. Um, oh, the weather's bipolar today, you know? Eh, yeah, sorry. Two poles, you know, it's up and down, sunny, rainy. Um, you're hot and cold as a person. And, and not everybody who is hot and cold or has mood swings is bipolar. 
we, we hear a lot. I don't know if this question is going to get asked today, but we hear, well, how do you know someone's borderline personality disorder or bipolar? Because people with borderline personality disorder, which thankfully is working on getting renamed because that's a, a difficult um, and name and there's a lot of stigma to that too. But people who have a personality that's very reactive to, to their environment can look bipolar because they can be, you know, very depressed and then angry and then, but it's really not as episodic and as long. The mood episodes are much more reactive and pretty hot, if you know what I mean. It's reactive. So really angry or, you know, really, uh, you know, depressed. The suicidal is more of a chronic. It's not episodic. A lot of people with bipolar struggle with chronic thought, feelings of emptiness, and I don't want to be here, and why should I? Frequent suicide attempts. So there are, true. I have people who are both bipolar and true bipolar disorder and borderline. Um, some people with borderline personality disorder do respond to mood stabilizers, but they don't meet the criteria for bipolar disorder. So, it, you know, that question about CP, uh, CPTSD PTSD, um, really, you know, brings up that differential diagnosis issue that all, all providers face a lot is, you know, what, what is it? And and just being patient and asking the questions and um, uh, paying attention to the diagnostic criteria. It's gonna lead you to the, and listening to the patient's stories, it's gonna help you make the correct diagnosis. Thank you so much. Um, next question says, how does Adderall work with the bipolar meds? Ah, that's a really good question. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so- That is a good um, question. So, um, so when 15 to 40%, 15 to 40% depends on the study of people with bipolar disorder have bona fide diagnosis symptoms and often on testing, um, ADHD presentation of ADHD. So what does stimulants do when someone's not on a mood stabilizer? What did we learn in the lecture? Treat the mood and then treat the ADHD. So, um, Although I will say that kids are often misdiagnosed with ODD or ADHD, oppositional defiant disorder or ADHD when they're bipolar. It's, you know, hard to, you know, my kid is acting out and they can't say, hey, I'm depressed um, or I feel racy in my head. So they're often diagnosed by, psychi by child psychiatrists as, as oppositional defiant or ADHD. And you give them a, give them a, um, an, a stimulant, guess what happens? They don't calm down like a person, like a kid with ADHD. Like, oh, all of a sudden Joey's sitting at his desk doing his homework. <laughs> Holy crap. You know, I put this kid on a stimulant and they're sitting down and they're listening to their teacher and they took their shoes off and didn't throw them, you know, across the room. They're like in the, you know, the room's more organized. Um, the kid with bipolar at ADHD, you treat them, or a kid with bipolar you treat with ADHD meds is more irritable. Um, more irritable, let's just put it that way. They just, they're more, more hyper. Um, so it usually makes them worse is the point. Well, guess what? That happens in adults too. So if you don't stabilize the mood, you're going to get a bad outcome with, with any stimulant at all or Ritalin or Focalin. Um, to answer your question though, just more specifically for Adderall, it is the most potent of the stimulants being an amphetamine and it, you, you, I'd be more careful. It's not that I don't have anybody. I have patients with bipolar on Vyvanse and, and Adderall, um, but your mood better darn well be well stabilized so that you're not destabilizing them. Um, I often start, if, if there is ADHD, I start my patients on the Ritalin products and only move to the amphetamine products because they're a little less overactivating. And only move to the amphetamine products if the Ritalin just uh, Ritalin Focalin aren't working, and then I'll move to uh, the amphetamine class. That's just my my preference. That was a good question. Thank you very much. Um, okay, next question says, how do we help the person with no self awareness, and <laughs> just doesn't believe that they are ill and don't need treatment or meds? That is a really really good question. Mm -hmm. 
So I'm generally not seeing those in my office because by the time people are coming to me, they've made an appointment, obviously, and are stepping into my office saying, hey, this isn't great. I have had on occasion people not agree with the bipolar diagnosis and um, had one a few years ago. She left when I said, no, you are bipolar. She left, saw somebody else who she convinced was ADHD, put her on Adderall, and she ended up hospitalized manic, floridly manic. Um, Mm -hmm. Family called me and said, will you take her back? I said, I never fired her. She she left. So of course she can come back. (laughs) I never terminated with her. So so I am still seeing her. Um, but yeah, not good. Um, um, so it, it, it's a challenge because unlike somebody who, um, well, unlike medical illnesses, which most people can embrace, not everybody, oh, I have my blood pressure, but I don't feel it. So I'm not going to take my blood pressure pills. It's the same thing for them because they're going to have morbidity and mortality. Morbidity is illness. Mortality is death. So we talk about morbidity and mortality and untreated um, illnesses. Now that applies to psych and medical. So you're going to have bad outcomes. Unfortunately, for those people who don't think they're sick, they're eventually going to have something. Loss of a job, loss of relationships, and maybe eventually they put two and two together. Um you know, it's just gentle or sometimes more forceful uh, discussions with them about, say, this is not right. Of course, most people in the hypomanic phases and manic phases don't see anything wrong. That's the problem with it. That's why they don't report it because they feel good. When they're really manic and have lost complete insight, then they're usually hospitalized anyway. Um, I mean, it's just sad to have to say that you know, a bad thing might have to ha- might have to happen, and or, or a few bad things might have to happen for that person to say, "Yeah, you know what? You're right. Something's not right." Um, and and it's sad, and it's sad to see that as a friend or family member that um, I have a patient whose dad committed suicide because he wouldn't take his lithium, and he just didn't think anything was really wrong with him. And that's the ultimate bad outcome. Absolutely. Um, But, oh, I I didn't really finish a a statement I was gonna say is in other medical illnesses, you know, like pneumonia, you can force somebody to get antibiotics, but you can't do that in psychiatry. Psychiatry Mm -hmm. is such an interactive, discipline we we have to have the patient's cooperation we can't force somebody to to have insight we can't force somebody we can occasionally legally force people to take medications that's not that common they have to be pretty ill and usually hospitalized but um it's still really hard if you're even if you're forcing someone to take meds and they fight it they can't get the full benefit of of it so it's this is a very difficult topic um, we see it a lot in substance abuse too. So it's a it's common theme and people with substance abuse is not seeing that they have a problem, not wanting to treat it. Thank you so much. Uh, it is a very hard and important topic. So I appreciate you spending some time on that one. Um, okay, next question says, what do you do with your patients who are on med not inherent? Or medication non-adherent. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> um, but that's kind of the, okay, so I gave you an example of the, the woman who had five depressions before she came to me and said, you know, I think I need to stay on my medications. And, mm-hmm. you know, not to get sarcastic, but in my head, like, um, you think? You know, like you had five of these. And, and she finally did. I mean, she finally got it. Um but this is a big problem in bipolar uh, patients is because one, it's episodic. And so in between episodes, people are feeling pretty good and, or they don't like the side effects or um, it can be an issue. Um, And they don't really, they don't like the side effects. We see that a lot. They go off of this is very common in schizophrenia too. A lot of medication non-adherence. So, 
for really seriously ill uh, bipolar patients, we can offer the injectables. If they'll mm -hmm. agree to it, we can't force them on it. But some people say, I forget my meds a lot, or um, and there are some of the atypicals that come in injectables. Um, those are the only ones that are injectable. I mean, uh, Depakote, Integritol, Lamotrigine, and Lithium don't have an injectable form. Um, but a lot of the atypicals that are mood stabilizers can be given as an, what's called an LAI, long acting injectable. Uh, and those might be appropriate for some people who have chronic or who are more seriously ill and chronically med, um, non-adherent and uh, can prevent episodes, but they would have to be appropriate for that kind of a treatment, but it can be, can be a help. Thank you, Dr. Spellman. Um, next question says, any tips for helping a young adult who is resistant to diagno diagnosis and treatment? I feel like we covered that. No, one that's kind of, we covered that one. Yeah. 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 Any differences between an adult and a young adult or do you, um, well, anybody who's 18 and older is considered an adult in the eyes of the law and in psych, you, the, the laws 18 and older, um, you have self-efficacy, you can advocate for your own treatment, say yes or no. Um, you are HIPAA protected. There's no, uh, childhood, you know, parental, um, rights at, right. at 80, at age 18. Um, Young adults have a, a little bit different set of circumstances, though. They're mm -hmm. often in school. Uh, sometimes they're not financially independent yet. Mm -hmm. um, so you have, have to take that into consideration. They might be on their parents' insurance or they might be living at home. Have a few of those in treatment. Um, mm -hmm. And um, uh, or young adults who are women of pregnancy age. That's a special circumstance that we need to take into consideration because some of these meds are not indicated for pregnancy, uh, are actually contraindicated. Um, so there are a number of factors that are more specific to the young adult population um, mm -hmm. and you know, developing independence and just working with them where they are in their life, their phase of life and taking that into consideration. Um, if they don't see the diagnosis, it's just, <laughs> I have to laugh because I have a patient who's the opposite. She knows she has bipolar. Um, she's probably also borderline, but she's got, she's been hospitalized a few times. So she's definitely bore, uh, bipolar and her parents don't, aren't supportive of medications and the diagnosis. So it's kind of the opposite. Um, but thankfully she has a good relationship with me. So that, that really helps just be patient, be patient, be available, encourage. And if you get angry, they're going to go away and not come back and, you know, maybe not find another provider. So try to encourage. Um, yeah, I do actually have a recommendation. Try to get them to see a therapist. So at least they're seeing somebody say, hey, well, you know, why don't you go talk about this with somebody? And then that person can keep an eye on them and reflect back to them. Well, do you know, do you see you're kind of talking fat? They'll, they'll see them more often than a psychiatrist would. And you can engage, you know, if you have a, 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 a number of referral sources um, that you work with, you can, you know, get a good rapport going with therapists and they they'll involve you. They'll call with the patient's permission. You have to have written permission um, and, and say, hey, Dr. Spellman, I was wondering if we could talk about, you know, what I'm seeing or, you know, hey, Joey is, is thinking may, maybe medications are indicated now. So it would be, that would be a way in is to get, to get them to see a therapist. That's a very good recommendation. Thank you very much. Um, Next one says, do you recommend sleep medication to help with sleep issues? If so, which ones? I, okay, oh, no I, medical I, advice. I'm sorry if I jumped in. What was the last part? Okay. <laughs> um, it says, I also have noticed my child has upside down life with late nights and sleeping out until noon. Uh, okay. So a little bit of a shifted sleep phase, um, which can be act an actual thing. It's an actual diagnosis. Um mm -hmm and can be tough to treat if there really is. In that case, specifically, you might think about getting a sleep um, evaluation and a sleep, um, uh, even a sleep study can look at that a little bit, um, see if there's a sleep disorder. But 
Sleep medications, really, really good question. I didn't cover them here. That's a whole lecture in itself. And of course, there are certain medications you don't want to get hooked on because they um, you, you develop tolerance and they can be develop this dependence, not addiction, not abuse, although that can be there too. But just you can get really sleep dependent, even on things that aren't addictive, even trazodone, which is commonly used. So we do try to use things that are not addictive first, um, like trazodone, gabapentin. Again, I don't want to give medical advice, but there are a number of sedating medications that aren't addictive and don't cause memory impairment. Um, so uh, I think you just have to talk to your provider. It depends on the age um, because there are meds we're not going to use in a kid that we might use in an adult. Um, benzodiazepines are, have this whole, you know, the clonopin, Xanax, Ativan, people probably heard of those. Um, you know what? Psychiatrists use them more than primary care. A lot of primary care have just refused to prescribe them because of all the bad, bad issues with them. But they can be very helpful, particularly in manic and hypomanic to, to, to avert um, an episode. So yes, I use them sometimes. Um, chronically, not, not as favorable, but um, with anybody. I mean, anybody will say that. But sometimes you have to use sleep meds to, to regulate a sleep cycle. Um, but talk to your doctor about it. You know, somebody's not sleeping or has a switched flip-flop sleep phase. Um, talk to your doctor about it. Um, if you're seeing a primary care provider, you know, consider then seeing a, consider seeing a specialist, you know, a psychiatrist or child and adolescent psychiatrist to get that, you know, additional input. Because internists and pediatricians do, and family practitioners do everything. I can't even, I'm so glad I'm not one of those. They have to keep so many things. They have to learn about so many things, psych being one thing, but then think about going to a psychiatrist. And this is all I do all day, every day, 30 years. So I'm going to know the nuances of these medications better. And I'm not putting down a, a and the, the interests I work with would agree with me. Like, yeah, no, I'm so glad you're taking care of that. I don't have to. Like, it's just not my comfort level. But but they often have to because if it's eight months till they can or a year till someone can get in to see me, somebody needs to manage their depression or anxiety disorder or bipolar and um or maybe give them a little bit of a benzodiazepine. So this is what I do. See see a specialist, get in to see somebody and who that's all they do. And even if it's just for a consultation, get get an input about it. Um, it can really help to see a specialist. You know, if you have a prostate problem and your primary care, it's kind of out of their comfort level. Yeah, I can give you Flomax, but anything else than that, you're going to go see a urologist, right? That's, that's what they do. So think about it. See a specialist. Next question says, should I tell my husband psychiatrist that he stopped his meds? He lies about it. He also hates if I monitor him. This is a common chronic issue uh, in relationships um, and in bipolar people who are lying and not, not taking care of themselves. So it depends is the, the, the answer. It's going to cause problems in your relationship. Yet if he's doing dangerous things or not really, it, 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 so let me just talk generally. So not about your husband, but if somebody is, is doing things to put themselves at danger, yes, you're going to tell somebody. If they're putting mm -hmm. themselves or other people at risk, that is one of the places you can break confidence. Well, you know, as a lay person, you don't have that, that HIPAA confidence thing, but I'm going to listen to somebody's spouse. Absolutely. If they call me and say, Hey, I just want to let you know, my husband is, you know, I'm really worried about him. He's um, up all night and is tr tried to take all the money out of our account to start a business. I, I don't know what to do. I'm like, okay, does he know you called? No. Well, I can't use that information unless you tell him I used it. So, ah, so that's always a little bit hard because you don't want, but you know, there's some pretty significant things that are going on there. Somebody suicidal, absolutely call somebody. That's a safety issue. Um, so if you're going to tell his psychiatrist, you tell your husband, I'm telling your psychiatrist because you're not right. They need to know the truth. This is not, and you're not helping yourself. If there's no, nothing um, 
harmful going on, then you have other decisions to make. Like, well, how how can I stay in this relationship when you're this unstable? What do we what do we do about that? Um, ah, there's so many levels about this, but it is hard in relationships. I hear this all the time. How to, you know, oh, you know, my spouse keeps saying, did you take your meds? You know, it's always monitoring me. So I get that because I hear that from the other end, from the patients. Um, but I always say it comes from a place of care. You know, if they mm -hmm. see you're not doing well, it's coming from a place of care. Let's, well, yeah, it's annoying. Okay. Are you taking your meds? And, you know, some people say yes. <laughs> Maybe it's just a relationship issue. And some people say, well, you know, I forget sometimes. So mm -hmm. it's a tough, get, get in family therapy, get in couples therapy. It, that's, that's the best thing. Communicate, have some feedback. And if they won't do it, then you get yourself in therapy. Well, I'm not the one with bipolar disorder. Uh, okay, but you're stressed and you're, you need some help managing the situation. Sorry, that's my dog. You need some help managing this. He's very upset that he's not allowed in this room right now. Um, <laughs> so get yourself in individual therapy. Absolutely. If, if, if your spouse won't go to, to uh, a family or couples therapy, then you go see somebody and figure out what, how to handle this and what to do. Absolutely. Uh, Dr. Spellman, we may have time for about one more question. Okay. We have about 16 questions left. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm so no. wordy. They've been really, okay. really, really good questions. I have to say. I know they really, they really were. Um, do we want to stay on for maybe another 10 minutes? Um, I, I'm fine. Whatever, whatever people in the audience, if there are still people signed on, I'm, I'm fine with that. Okay. Sounds great. Um, okay. Let's move on to the next question. It says, what is your suggestion of where to go or what to do when your loved one is in a crisis and uses words like I want to kill myself, but you know, that's not what they will do. They just need help now. Going to the local hospital, which is what a psychiatrist therapist messages would say when trying to reach out, it is not what they need. There Are there places to go uh, in the Chicago area that is not an ER? So if you mean like right now tonight, no, you have to go to an ER. But there are a number, um, of course, I'm most familiar with the ones on the North Shore, but there are a number of, um, and they're growing, um, PHP programs, partial hospital programs, where um, if they don't meet inpatient criteria, they can um, get seen and evaluated usually within a few days. So it's not crisis, I'm gonna do something tonight or hurt myself or they're manic, but they can't wait four months or six months for a psych appointment um, and maybe a therapist isn't quite enough. Yes, call, uh, you can Google PHPs, but there's Compass, there's Sky, oh shoot, I'm remember forgetting the uh, SunCloud, um, there's, there, there's a program in Skokie, um, Synchrony Brain Health, there's, um, uh, Alexian Brothers has a has a PHP IOP programs out in Hoffman Estates. Uh, Waukegan um, Lake Behavioral has a PHP program, and these programs are for people who are either coming out of the hospital to step out to down, or to avoid going into the hospital. So you need something more than just seeing a psychiatrist or a therapist, but you need, um, and, and so it's more intensive, but you don't need inpatient and in those programs, you see a psychiatrist within a week, within a week. So it's, you know, they can do be that stepping stone till you're, uh, you know, and in the meantime, make an appointment with an outpatient psychiatrist because it'll be a wait. But then you're getting treatment on the way to getting in with somebody um, outpatient. So, yeah, check out PHP programs and 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 uh, get an evaluation for one. They're they're all over the, the Chicago land area. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Spellman. And I'm I'm not sure if you can see my written responses on all ends or if it just goes straight to the, the person who asked the question. Um, but if a person is in crisis um, at, at the Turning Point building where the NAMI office is located in Skokie, mm -hmm. they do have what's called a living room. And I think you kind of touched on that oh, a yeah, little yeah. bit. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they do have the living room, right. Yeah, yeah. so it's, it's a great resource. I highly recommend it. Um, it is for... Uh, people again who may be in crisis or who just want to, you know, talk to somebody 
Um, they're trained professionals there. They can help you de-escalate, and it is a wonderful substitute for going to the ER. So absolutely, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of those, and that's I in know. Skokie, right? Yeah, there's one in yeah. Skokie. I believe there's one in Northbrook, but don't quote me on that. I know there's a few in the Cook County North Suburban area. Um, I know that the one in Skokie, uh, it's not yet 24 hours a day, seven days a week, but they are working on it. And I know their now, hours are- that, that doesn't good. include a psychiatrist though, right? Then that's just drop-in crisis, crisis intervention only. Correct. Yeah, okay. it, it's exactly that. Yeah. Okay. Um, trained professionals, not doctors. Um, and they can help you through crisis situations, but, um, I do know it's not just utilized for crisis support. I believe it's also used for people who just, you know, need okay. to be with somebody yeah. to talk yep. to somebody. Whereas the PHP or IOP, you have to meet criteria to enter the program. And unfortunately, I'm sorry, be insured in some way. Um, those programs generally, um, well, the one at Lakes takes Medicaid, um, but the, a lot of the private ones don't take Medicaid and some don't even take Medicare. So um, uh, Alexian Brothers takes Medicare, but not public aid. So, you know, they would, they would go over that with you if you call, but, and they would refer you to a place that would, but so I know insurance is an annoying, but realistic, you know, reality <laughs> issue that we have to deal with every day. Yes, absolutely. Uh, NAMI CCNS also does have a resource line. Um, so if in the event you, you're having some challenges finding some places, um, we do have a list of places that offer one insurance over the other. So there's another option for you if that's something that you know you may need. Um, thanks, Dr. Spillman. Okay, let's see. Um, one person says, I just finished an IOP. Very helpful. What are your thoughts on IOP? Well, I just kind of said they're very yeah. helpful. <laughs> so the difference between IOP and PHP. So PHP is partial hospitalization program. Those are usually all day programs, nine to three typically. Um, and they are basically what it says. They're a hospital program that you don't have to stay overnight at. So it's all the components of what people would get in an inpatient care unit, but not the protective environment. So you get all the groups, you get the nurse, you get a, a physician, um, it's your medication management, intensive. So someone who's fairly ill, but not, hang on, my dog is going to scratch up this door <laughs> that my, my husband just painted. Um, and um, attention. so it, it's, it's really, you know, in, nice care, uh, intensive care. So you're going every day. And those programs are usually four to six weeks. Um, so really immersed in care for someone who's pretty ill, but not um, requiring inpatient care. IOP is less intense than that. It's usually three hours, nine to noon, one to four. A lot of the addiction programs are, are IOPs, but they're six to nine because people do go to them after work, six to 9 p.m. Um, so an IOP is intensive outpatient. So it's a step down even from, so a lot of people who do a PHP program will step down into an IOP and it's somewhat intensive program. Obviously every day, sometimes you're stepping down to four days a week or three days a week. I don't think it's less than three. Most programs aren't less than three and where you get, you know, so it's more than seeing a therapist once a week um, so that you can get some of that intensive care because you just need a little bit more. Um, and uh, that, no, they're very, very helpful. Again, that group, part of its group. So you see other people who are struggling with some of the same issues. Um, most of the programs have different tracks. So a mood disorder track and anxiety disorder track, a dual diagnosis track, which means a mental illness with a substance abuse. Um, a lot of them now have trauma tracks or mm -hmm. a trauma emphasis where, you know, you're dealing with a mood disorder, but in the context of a trauma, uh, trauma history. Um, so it, it, they're really getting, um, it's just so nice to see in my, my career, the attention that mental illness is getting and the destigmatization and the resources that are available to people and to have programs like this and where there are actually tracks, whereas they just had a PHP before and everybody went to the same program. And now they actually, you know, help patients who, you know, okay, you're going to be with other people who have anxiety disorders. You're going to be with people who have mood disorders. You're going to have an older, the um, Compass has um, a young adult 
um, and an adolescent program. So mm -hmm. um, a lot of them do. Um, a, cu a couple in um, Northbrook have eating disorder tracks, which are very specialized. So you can't, you know, eating disorder patients can't be treated with the general um, because there's such specific treatment needs in people with eating disorders. So great question. They're great programs, a lot of support. Um, and if the patient makes use of them, they can really get a lot out of them. Absolutely. Um, I did see, sorry, I was kind of moving around. I was looking okay. for some hours um, for the, the living room. Somebody did ask about the, the hours of the living room and the turning point office. Mm -hmm. I did respond via chat. I'm not sure if everybody can see it. So if not, um, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, 8 a.m. through 8 p.m., Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, noon to 8 p.m. And again, they are working on 24-7. They're just, you know, they're not quite there yet. So. And everybody knows about the 988 yes. suicide hotline. Great resource. It's a great resource. Please, it's explain. not, you know, hours on hold. You know, most mm -hmm. calls are answered within five minutes, if not 15, you know, if they're extra busy. Um, but it's, you know, pretty, these people are trained. They're not just... Mm -hmm. um, here's some bad press when it first opened, like, well, they're going to call, you know, um, your local police. Well, they will, if they're worried, if they really think that somebody's at risk, but mostly it's talking resource and they're trained mm -hmm. when to, when to call in, when to just, you know, be a, a resource for, for people. So, um, huge decrease in ER visits, um, mm -hmm. suicide attempts, um, it's being measured right now, but it looks like it's going to be pretty positive data. So um, it is a resource, 988. So you don't have to remember that 800 number that I don't even remember what it was. You know, I can never <laughs> remember what that number is, but now yeah. 988, that's the suicide hotline. Yeah, it makes it easy. Are there any more questions? Cause I wanted to, I'm kind of surprised this one wasn't asked. So I'll, I'll address it if it's. Yeah, absolutely. If there's not. So, so I'm kind of surprised that no one asked about cannabis. Can, how about marijuana and bipolar disorder? Isn't that great? Mm -hmm. you want my honest opinion no not so much yeah do people do a lot of my not a lot but enough a fair number you oh but i sleep better okay i will tell you one thing and no one can argue with me about this because you can try but the data shows that cannabis in 25 and younger is bad for your brain mm -hmm. nine times increased risk of developing a psychotic disorder when used by young people nine times nothing to be messed with and who's using it are young people. Um, yeah. I do have older patients, you know, adults, I should say, who use it for pain, sleep. Bipolar though, it's not, and chronic use affects mm -hmm. your memory. That's been shown that research that did actually looked at over a year, um, the size of the, of the area the, uh, that of the brain that, um, two areas that deal with memory and motivation those areas shrunk with chronic use, mm -hmm. memory and motivation, which duh, makes sense, right? You're kind of out of it and you're kind of like, oh, I don't feel like doing anything. Um, so those, those actually shrink those areas of the brain. And this was well done study over, over a year. Um, in general, it's, it's not helpful to the bipolar itself. It might be helpful for a symptom of anxiety or I'm not sleeping, but even so I'm not, a, not a fan, not, not a big fan. So um, I do get that question from my patients a lot, which is why I thought to bring it up. I thought it would come up. I'm kind of surprised it didn't, but um, yeah, yeah, it's not, not, um, and, and the increased risk of developing psychosis, not, not worth it if you ask me. So if people ask me, I'm like, yeah, I'm not a big fan. Nope. Yeah, that statistic is very high for, for young adults and, and youth. That's, I didn't even know that that's pretty um, yep. substantial. So thank you yep. for addressing that. Um, so we do have quite a few questions left. Oh my uh, gosh. How are you feeling, Dr. Spellman? <laughs> um, well, maybe a couple it's more. Great. It's great. A couple more? Okay. Sounds yeah, good. Read through them and make sure they aren't repeats. So Sounds great. Um, okay. Let's see. Do, 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 do. Um, can the severity of degree of bipolar disorder subside as the person ages from age 30s to 50s? Or would this likely be because the person has managed so well over the years and is very invested in treatment? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, 
So definitely it could be the second. I mean, absolutely. When people manage their illness and to spend less time in illness, in the illness state, um, and take their meds, you do decrease morbidity, you decrease illness. Um, what I see and, and research supports this is that the tends to the depressions tend to be more common as people get older, the bipolar mania, mania episodes tend to be less the up moods. I see this a lot tend to be less. So, um, and of course that's the not fun, um, part of bipolar. So, um, I do see that the depressions can get more, more common. Um, and so the manias can kind of burn out or get less common. I don't know if that helps, but certainly the second is people manage their illness, they mature, they have better coping skills. You know, if you do the DBT or CBT and you have better coping skills, you're gonna respond better. So when you look kind of ill or you like off balance and unhealthy younger, and then you matured, it's like, oh, well, you know, I'm not 25 and drinking and maybe their habits change, maybe they're sleeping better, maybe they're not drinking. Um, you know, got mature, have a good steady relationship. A lot of things could impact. Maybe they have a lot of therapy and dealt with some childhood trauma, you know, adverse, they just better headspace. Um, all those things could make someone look better when they're 50 than compared to when they were 30. Thank you so much. Um, I'm typing in some answers as well. Just the ones that I know I'm mm -hmm. nowhere near this. <laughs> your level of expertise. Um, let's see. So somebody said, what is the capacity for someone with bipolar disorder to work long-term? Oh gosh, that varies. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you, there are famous people who have bipolar disorder and they have high positions in media and, um, so, you know, television and, uh, CEOs. I mean, I've treated people who all, all levels, but then I have people who can't work at all and are a disability because they, they just are so ill most of the time. So it just varies. So uh, it's one of the most treatable illnesses, but some people have a, a short stick and don't get the as treatable kind or um, takes a while to find the right meds or um, so it varies all the way from disability to high power job, doing fine, have to manage their sleep or, you know, watch things more carefully, take their meds, but it could be anywhere. Um, let me see. One person asked, where can you find an interpersonal and social rhythm therapist? So gosh, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> if you Google it, sometimes there are websites that in your area will show that. You can go onto psychologytoday.com. It's a, mm -hmm. uh, and those therapists are vetted that they have that degree, that they actually exist because those therapists pay to be on that website. So that's psychologytoday.com. And when you, um, there's types of therapy. And, uh, so you can put in your zip code, you can put in your insurance. I mean, it's a great website. You can put if you wait, want male or female. Um, and then you can do, you know, what you're treated, like I have bipolar or I have OCD or something. And then you can um, pick types of therapy. So that would be something you could pick and see who puts it on their, on their profile that they do that kind of therapy. Thank you so much. Um, let's see. Also, I don't know, maybe DBSA might have some of that information or NAMI. I don't yeah, know. Absolutely. Yeah. Please call her. Some, some people who, who have just made themselves available like these are, but I would just Google, you know, social rhythm therapy and see what comes up in your area. Social rhythm therapist near me, interpersonal. A lot of people do interpersonal therapy. That's a, that's a big thing right now. That's a big type of therapy to know. So a lot of the programs train in it. So people who are coming out of training in the last five years, a lot of, a lot of people, five, 10 years, um, most of them know interpersonal therapy. Thank you so much, Dr. Spellman. Those resources are, are fantastic. And I was able to jot like one or two down um, as you were talking. So uh, in case you need that, that's there for you. Um, Dr. Spellman, we have about 10 questions left. Um, are there still people on? So there's still people hanging around? Let's see. 
Yes, there are still people on. So you ready? So maybe a couple more. Then okay. Then then I need That's to take good. my dogs out. But they're they're <laughs> very like sweet. They, like, Let me they're so that. happy that I let them in the room with me. So <laughs> That's hilarious. Um, okay, well, great. Uh, let's see. Next one. Um, I feel like this one might have already been answered. This question is is about you know somebody who um, you know may not fully accept their diagnosis and how do you um, respond or how do you how do you interact with that person? And I feel like that was. That was answered. Um, do you... Yeah, it's, it's hard. I just have to be pretty gentle if I want to try to keep them. Eventually, I I uh, told one gentleman, well, I think you're bipolar and need meds after meeting with him four or five times and trying to listen to his story and developing a rapport. Finally, I just had to tell him because he didn't want meds and he's just coming to see me um, and clearly not. He had symptoms and he left. Mm -hmm. You know, he just didn't, he didn't mm. continue to come see me. Like, okay. I mean, there's only so, I mean, he's gentle and tried to, you know, get him to talk to me and develop a relationship before I said, I know some psychiatrists are you have bipolar. I'm like, but that's not my style. So I tried to engage him and listen and help him understand that I was an advocate. But finally I had to say, no, I, I do think you need meds. And anybody who's told him that he's left and he did, he just left and he was in his... 50s or early 60s so that's kind of interesting and obviously he was sent to me because it was a legal situation and and he was yeah clearly other people thought he was too but it's hard you know it's hard sometimes we can't do a whole lot yeah it is hard um you know and, and you have right you have the degree you have the licensure and you know when when we don't it's you know we can't say for sure so going right. through that simple approach i you know it's great advice totally um okay let's see one more one more okay let's see all right this one i think is a good one to end on um it's got a little bit of um something that we can all do. It's a more of a practical question, which I really appreciate. So this one says, how does one motivate themselves to do all the healthy living things when they are just not able to? Oh my gosh, that's an amazing question. It's so, right? so spot on. Same. Um, because, yeah. So what, what's important is that you do those things. Um, my my 50 pound dog just said, decided right now, he's a lap dog. One second. Okay, okay, buddy. Um, you, you have to establish those routines when you're well, or when you're mm -hmm. relatively well, and they become routines. It's really hard to start these routines when you're sick, you know, when you're depressed, duh, you know, I don't feel like getting out of bed or doing the dishes, let alone, you know, going for a walk or, you know, <laughs> getting on an app and tracking my mood or yes. <laughs> getting to, you know, no, I can't get out of bed, let alone get us a good sleep routine. So these really have to be part established. Uh, these routines need to be created and established when you're healthy. Um, so work with your provider, treat the depression, treat the hypomania mania. Then don't say when you're well, well, I'm well great you know right i can just do whatever no you know start establishing those routines get on an exercise routine which is hard to maintain when you're depressed but when you're depressed and you don't feel like working out on your elliptical for an hour okay go for a walk for 10 minutes you know right. it, it, pare down your expectations but still have some expectations um understand uh. that you gosh you know i'm depressed and i want potato chips i don't want a carrot and an apple <laughs> um, but okay. So maybe I'll have a carrot and some potato chips, you know, um, I'll eat a bowl of soup and a bowl of popcorn rather than three donuts and, you know, a scoop of ice cream. Um, it, you know, when you're ill, just adjust your expectations, but still have in mind that self-care is important. So just do your best. Don't beat yourself up because that just makes everything worse. Mm -hmm. um, and just do your best. Ask for help. Ask for help. Like, hey, you know, your spouse, friend, parent, somebody. Um, 
you know, I, I need help maybe doing my dishes, but, but I'll try to go do this. Just ask for help and, and do your best and work with your provider to treat your symptoms so that you can get back on that healthy routine and just don't beat yourself up. It's just not, doesn't, doesn't help anybody. Absolutely. Um, and we did have a webinar last month, Dr. Leslie Bracken from Compass. Oh, okay. uh, she, she spoke on depression and at the end of the, uh, at the end of her presentation, she provided some tips, um, um, within that as well. So um, thank you, Dr. Spellman. That was great. And if you do need some additional resources, uh, you can go on to our website. We do have all of our webinars posted on our website. So check out the depression one from, um, from February of this year, and you should be able to get some additional tips as well. Um, let's see. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Well, that was thank you, everybody, amazing. for attending and for <laughs> letting me speak and uh, helping awareness and um, hopefully better outcomes. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you, Dr. Spellman. This was an incredible, incredible webinar. I mean, we had hundreds of questions. So I really appreciate your time. Um, I know you're a very, very busy woman. So thank oh, you. Thank you. It's my pleasure. And I'm sorry, my whatever, both my devices weren't uh, camera friendly today. So all good. That's the life we live now in Zoom land, right? Right. right. <laughs> Um, okay, well, if you all did enjoy tonight's program, you can find more information uh, of our upcoming events at www.namiccns.org. We do have our annual gala coming up in May, so more information will be uh, announced coming very, very soon. Um, our next program for our webinar series will be held on April 24th from 7 o'clock to 830 where Dr. Matthew Filippo, a mental health professional from Advocate Medical Group, will teach us what we need to know about schizophrenia. Uh, our April webinar is also going to be sponsored by the Glenview Public Library. So huge thank you to you all again for making this happen and next month happen as well. Uh, once you log off, you will see a short survey. Please, 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 please take it. <laughs> it will only take you a couple of minutes. Um, this will not only allow us to better understand how we performed and how we uh, how we did, but it will also give us information that we need to write grants and raise money so we can continue providing our programs for free. Um, other than that, we appreciate you all coming, staying, asking questions, speaking. Uh, we really appreciate you all, um, and we look forward to seeing you at a next NAMI CCNS event. Thank, thank you, you so, so much, much for all the great questions. Yeah, thank yeah. you, Dr. Spellman. Right. I'll be sending you some results later on this week. Oh, great. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Have a Thanks. great night. Thanks, Have you your too. Dog. <laughs> all right, bye-bye. Bye, everyone.